Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord, and uh, Lord, what a neat thing to be thought of as the neighborhood church. But Lord, it's your church, that's what we're sure of. And so Lord, we give you our attention this evening as we open your word, we just ask that you would instruct us, help us to find application for our lives, and Lord, uh, we are just privileged to be in your presence tonight. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, you can make your way to... Esther chapter 7, not sure how far we're going tonight, there's a possibility we actually could finish this book tonight, depending upon how that goes, not that I'm trying to rush us, but this story flows so well, it's hard not to just keep going. When we finished chapter 6, we saw Mordecai come into the presence of the king or excuse me, Haman, in the presence of the king, trying to set up Mordecai, trying to bring him to his demise. And we saw God's hand at work with the king, having recently discovered that they never did anything for Mordecai when he spoiled a plot against the king himself. And we saw Haman come into the king's throne room and immediately be asked, what would you do for to honor a a great man in the kingdom and Haman thinking that it was himself that was going to be honored made a list and his plan was spoiled right there because on the king's mind was Mordecai the very man that Haman was coming in to pronounce death upon and so as I feel I've said many times and you can't help but continue to say it God not mentioned but God apparent in just every part of this story as it unfolds and then the very last verse of chapter 6 really begins the next chapter, chapter 7. So let's pick up with that last verse of chapter 6, verse 14. It says, While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Now that eunuchs came to grab Haman as he was speaking to his family. And his family really had just given Haman really no hope of what was coming um, because they felt basically if Mordecai was going to have favor then he he didn't stand a chance and it was even his family that saw that so let's pick up with verse 1 of chapter 7 so so the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther remember this is the second time she brings them to dine with her and on the second day at the banquet of wine the king again said to Esther what is your petition Queen Esther it shall be granted to you what is your request up to half the kingdom it shall be done i'm thinking the king is kind of desperate to hear what she has to say now the second time they've come together and she still hasn't really said what she's after verse three then queen esther answered and said if i have found favor in your sight o king and if it pleases the king let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request for we have been sold my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So Esther finally makes known her request. And she demonstrated great tact in doing so. It may seem like she waited a while, and we came up with some reasons maybe that she did wait, but she didn't immediately earlier identify herself as a Jew. She doesn't really write here either. She doesn't speak of herself as a Jew that's targeted for death for, as part of this massacre that's coming. And you recall that Haman did the same thing when he hid the identity of the group that he targeted for annihilation. When he went to the king, he didn't say I was going to, that he was going to kill all the Jews. He just said there was a certain people. As a matter of fact, we read that read that back in chapter 3 verse 8 Haman said to the king there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom so Haman wasn't honest about who these people were and now Esther is taking her time identifying who they are and putting herself amongst them so she was both tactful and she was wise because here she appeals to the king on a personal basis not so much about who these people are, but that this massacre is going to include her, his queen, his wife. And she knows that she's never done anything but things to please the king, so she feels she has favor in bringing this request forward. Look at verse 5. 
So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? When I read that, I have to ask the question, did the king really not know that it was he that authorized this plan? That really he was part of this great thing that was about to take place, that she was asking to be overturned. Look at verse 6. And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is the wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen so she charges this wicked Haman right there to his face in front of the king. And now the true character of Haman is fully revealed to anyone that was there listening, and in particular, and most importantly, the king himself. Verse 7, Then the king arose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. Now this fact that the king arose... We can understand his wrath, although it's a little bit misplaced because he's involved in, again, what took place. And it says that he went out to the palace garden. And I think the king is now dealing with the fact that he was played as a fool. He was played as a fool by Haman in obtaining this decree to kill all of the Jews, which now he learns would be conclude his queen. And I'm thinking his conscience is certainly bothering him as this realization comes into his mind and he goes out into the garden probably just to vent into the air probably just didn't want to be seen in that moment so angry and feeling foolish and he had to be wrestling with his part in approving this scheme and I'm betting it just hit a bit closer to home than he had ever anticipated look at verse 8 when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I am in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So Haman, fearing for his life, he's pleading with Esther, and he casts himself, it says, across this couch, which I'm imagining maybe she was sitting on as well. So the king comes back and sees what looks like an assault by this man on top of everything else that was taking place. And without even a word from the king, the servants there, they come and they cover Haman's face, which I see as an apparent preparation for his execution. But I think it was evident to those that served the king, they didn't need to be told what was coming next because of the great insult. And they probably heard this disclosure by Esther as well. Look at verse 9. Now Harbanah, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good in the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's wrath subsided. Remember, we talked about this gallow that he had built, 70 feet high, 75 feet high. And we talked about, even though it talks about hanging, that it seems by the historian of the time that it wasn't so much actually what we consider hanging that they would actually impale the person um, completely there on a sharp stake whichever way ever way they did it it was still pretty horrendous so Haman meets his demise on the same instrument that he intended for the death of Mordecai caught in his own trap and once again we see the hand of God without a direct reference to him again each thing lines up that he would bring this accounting of the wicked, that he would continue to bless his people. And truth be told, God often allows the wicked to destroy themselves. He gets out of their way, turns them over to, to whatever it is they really desire in their heart. We read about that in Psalm 7, beginning in verse 14 there, it says, Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. God's real good about getting out of our way when we decide in our own will to do what is not pleasing to him. I think the Holy Spirit as believers will convict us, try to get us back on the right road, but so often he's not going to stop us when we've made a decision decision to do something destructive 
especially willfully. So we see the same process that we're reading about here really play out even in the book of Revelation where God defends his people, the Jews, against the wrath of Satan until the wicked are finally destroyed. We see that here. He's protecting his people as the wicked are really destroying themselves. Another great example of this is when Satan thought that he'd won by getting the crowd to crucify Jesus. But the cross turned out to be an instrument of his own defeat. You know, on the cross, the death of a substitute satisfied the wrath of our heavenly king. Here, in this case, of Mordecai and Haman, it was the guilty dying in the place of the innocent. And in the case of us and Jesus, it's a matter of the innocent dying in the place of the guilty. We were the guilty. He took that death upon himself. Let's move into chapter 8. On that day, the king, Osiris, gave Queen Esther the house of Haman the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Haman's house is given to Esther, and his position was given to Mordecai. Another picture of the continued blessing that God is providing And really, you know, prior to this, it appeared that Haman had achieved everything. But he ended up with nothing. Not even anything to pass on to his family. And he would have been wise to have learned from the conclusion of Solomon, who carefully considered these things. Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so Haman had paid attention to what the scripture said. He would have realized that he could not hide what he had done. There was no chance of it. Verse 3. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which had devised He had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king and if I have found favor in his sight and the thing seems right to the king and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? How can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? So even now with Haman out of the way, this destructive plot, it's still in motion. There was still that day coming where they would annihilate all the Jews. All that has happened so far is they got rid of one of them that authored that great plan. And once again, Esther appears before the king and again she's uninvited, which means again she's risking her own life And then she tearfully pleads for her people. So the king again puts out the golden scepter, giving her permission, showing her grace (coughs) so that she could come in and speak with him. And she asks for that first decree to be revoked. (coughs) But we talked about it before. According to the law, the Persian law, there was no way that that decree could be taken back. So Esther, in her request, she says this, Let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman. Now, we might have expected her to ask this earlier, maybe during that first dinner. But again, I think you see her wisdom, and I think God orchestrating her steps, that she brought these things in stages before the king. If she had brought it all at once, it may have been overwhelming, not understood, and probably wouldn't worked out. And I think that's a lesson for us is that things don't happen all at once with God. Sometimes they do, and we're happy when they do. But sometimes things happen in stages. God shows us pieces, little by little, and he's building us towards a complete revelation of whatever it is he's unfolding for us. And remember, he also gave adequate time for this whole thing to unfold. It wasn't for another year that that annihilation of the Jews would even come. I mean, it could have been the next day. But they remember, they drew lots for the date. They drew the purr 
and we'll, we'll get to that again here soon. Pick up in verse 7. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hands on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, to the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred with, from swift steeds. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions." On one day in all the provinces of King Asaurus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all the people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The carriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. So what we see here is the king, as I said a moment ago, could not revoke the previous decree. So he made another decree, giving the Jews support by letting them fight and destroy their attackers when that attack came. The king's scribes were called and Mordecai dictated the edict, which gave the Jews the right to protect their lives. And then we see here with great speed, this new law was carried to the furthest parts of the kingdom on royal horses. You know, that's a great picture, really, of you know, how the good news of a, of, a, of a person's redemption from the power of evil through the shed blood of Jesus should spread. Spread all throughout the land, which is really Satan's realm, as long as he is allowed to wield his power here on earth. Just interesting how the news was sent out so fast and so far. Verse 15, so Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor. So now we get this picture of Mordecai. He put off the sackcloth and he leaves the palace in robes of splendor. And it tells us here the Jews were filled with gladness and joy when they heard of the sudden turn of events. And God's purpose in all these matters goes further than the sparing of the Jews from destruction. He also purposed to raise up Mordecai as the prime minister, as a replacement for Haman. Look at verse 17. In every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So when the people saw God working on the behalf of this people, it was so convincing, not only the work itself, but their response to it, that their witness actually brought many of the people over to actually become Jews. You know, that should be the result of every great work of God. The people would be convicted and actually brought over to the, to, to the side that we're on in a, in, a, in, a, in a life of faith. Let's pick up in chapter 9. Now in the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed. On the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, the opposite occurred, in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. The Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to help, <clears throat> excuse me, to lay hands on those who sought their harm 
and no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all the people. And all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. So when that faithful day arrived, which was the 13th day of the 12th month, the Jews gathered together in their respective cities and they destroyed the enemies. Even the princes and the rulers helped the Jews because they feared Mordecai, now the second most powerful man in the kingdom. And they also had the king on their side, which was a great asset and all of his resources as well. And with the king with them, it didn't really matter who was against them. And you know, the truth is we all have enemies, even as Christians in this life. But as believers, we have a king as well, a king with a capital K. And we're told in Romans, it asks the question, what then shall say, say we say to these things, speaking of our enemies? And it goes on to that great statement, if God is for us, who can be against us? And we see that just in the success that these Jews had over their enemies. They were able to utterly destroy them with God's help. Look at verse 6. And in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. And then you have, I won't bother reading them, you have the names of 10 men there in the next three verses. And then it identifies those 10 men in verse 10. It says the 10 sons of Haman. So they were amongst those that they destroyed in Shushan were all the sons of Haman. And so we now see this judgment extend even to his family. The ten sons of Haman, the sons of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, they killed. and They did not lay a hand on the plunder. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan citadel was brought to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, The Jews have killed and destroyed five hundred men in Shushan the citadel, and the ten sons of Haman. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Oh, what is your further request? It shall be done. Then Esther said, If it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow, according to today's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, and they did not lay a hand on the plunder. So again, we have the 500 killed in the capital alone, along with the 10 sons of Haman. It gets reported to the king in his curiosity, if they killed that many there, how many have they killed throughout all the provinces? And Esther gets a second chance, a chance to request something else. And she asks for an additional day to be given so that they can continue to purge this evil from the land. And in that next day, 300 more were executed. And she slipped into that request that the sons of Haman would be hung publicly as well. Now we need to remember, as we've talked about before, that Haman and his sons were descendants of the ancient Amalekites. You can't really pull that out of this story. This is another thing that God's accomplishing now in this story that really goes back much further and should have been taken care of it, taken care of an awful long time again ago. Because God commanded Saul, the son of Kish, to execute the full extent of God's jump judgment against the Amalekites. But he failed to do that. He failed to kill or utterly destroy them all. But, so even though Saul failed, but this later descendant of the same tribe, also a son of a man named Kish, as we've come to know as Mordecai, completes God's judgment against this people. And I think that's very interesting once again to see God's plan be completed. No matter how long it took, no matter who he had to do it through, what God decreed to happen was going to happen, even though man did not 
fully obey what God had told them so much before this time. Look at verse 16. The remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies and killed 75,000 of their enemies. But they did not lay a hand on the plunder. We've been told that three times now. They didn't lay a hand on the plunder, even though it was decreed that they could take it all. And I believe the fact that they didn't show that they were just looking to protect themselves. They weren't looking to gain monetarily or materially from any of this. Let's look at verse 17. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. On the 14th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Shushan assembled together on the 13th day, as well as on the 14th. And on the 15th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled town celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. Continue on verse 20. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and the 15th days of the month of Adar, as the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as the month which has, was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday, that they should make these, them days of feasting and joy of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written to them, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and cast Pur, which is the lot, to consume them and destroy them. But when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. So they called these days Purim, after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions, according to the pres prescribed time, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed amongst the Jews, and, and the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. So we read that they had this great feast, two different time frames, but they were able to use both those dates as the celebration of this feast of Purim. And again, we're reminded that that Purim comes from that word Pur, which speaks of the lots that Haman had cast. And again, I believe probably some of you have been in churches over the years where they actually celebrate Purim. It's, a, it's a, usually a great um, celebration for kids especially because they kind of play out some of this and speak of the evil Haman and everybody gets to hiss and make noises back uh, you know, toward, towards that character. And we see Mordecai, he decreed that both those dates, as I said, were observed by all the Jewish people and be celebrated annually. Pick, pick up in verse 29. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, with Mordecai, the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdoms of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them, and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning matters of their fasting and lamenting. So the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. So as we read this, it's apparent there was two letters that were sent out to all the Jews, charging them to keep the feast of Purim. We read about the first letter in verse 20, and then the second letter in verses 29 to 32. And then here we see that these things were written in the book. And I believe that was probably the Chronicles of the Kingdom, that book that they're speaking of there. So it looks like we are going to finish. I'm not really sure who did the numbering, but we come to chapter 10. 
all three verses. I guess it just didn't seem a good thing to end of chapter 9. These three verses got their own chapter. And King Ahasuerus imposed tribute on the land and on the islands of the sea. Now all the acts of his power and his might and the account of the greatness of Mordecai to which the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second to the king Ahasuerus and was great among the Jews and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all his countrymen. You know, we consider this book ten chapters <laughs> or nine chapters in a couple of verses. You just got to marvel at all the things that God arranged in this book. Everything that the world would call coincidence or chance or fate. But it was all the perfect hand of God bringing about what he would do for his people. And that's what we really see. I mean, it was a the largest empire at that time ever known on the earth. And in there was this group of Jews that God would once again preserve. And he preserves them through every great book of this Bible. He preserves them. He still preserves them today. Even though even today they live in almost entirely in disobedience. Not recognizing Jesus as Lord and Savior. Listen to this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says, there it is. Man is a free agent in what he does, responsible for his actions, and verily guilty when he does wrong, and he will be justly punished too, and if he be lost, the blame will rest with him himself alone. But yet, there is one who ruleth over all, who without complicity in their sin makes even their, even their actions of wicked men to subserve his holy and righteous purposes. Believe these two truths, and you will see them in practical agreement in daily life, though you will not be able to devise a theory for harmonizing them on paper. I love that quote because basically it's exactly what we see in this book. That each individual, every character that we saw in this book, is a sovereign person. There is the sovereignty of man and there's the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of man speaking the fact that we have free will. And each individual that we read about in this story and what Charles Spurgeon was pointing out and look around you in everyday life and you'll see this unfold. Every person has a free will. And yet, with whatever they cho chose, either for righteousness or sin, God will use their very actions or go around them to bring his great purpose to bear and i love how he sums it up he says believe these two truths and you will see them in practical agreement in daily life though you will not be able to devise a theory for harmonizing them on paper in other words we look at this we see the the sovereignty of man the sovereignty of god the free will of man the perfect will of god and even though we can kind of wrap our minds around that lightly we would be hard-pressed to actually be able to explain how those two things coexist. And yet they do. God being fully in charge, fully bringing his plan to bear, and yet we get to move through it as these free agents, yet all the time moving in the direction that he would take us. And if that direction is away from him and refusing him, as Spurgeon said, that will fall on that individual's head. God will not need to take responsibility for that. That will be on the individual. God, God truly has still left us many mysteries about himself and the way he works. I mean, think about this story. Haman did what he pleased. The king did what he wanted. Mordecai and Esther too. And yet, the perfection of the plan that was brought to fruition is astounding. And it's also to be understood that even though God has this providential plan, and even though he's moving it towards an end that is perfect, he still allows his people to be tested. And the truth is, sometimes tested severely. You know, we're probably moving into times that we might look around and say, wow, you know, a time of testing has come. And I believe we could probably say that right now. 
that a time of testing has come. How severe it will become, I don't know. But even in this severe time, God's at work. His plan is before us. We who call upon the name of Jesus are part of that plan. As I've said now on Sundays for a couple weeks, as we study the book of Acts, the book's still being written, and we're in it. We're now the players in that great story. So one of the things we need to learn from that is we really should never assume that as servants of God that we're going to be protected from every trial. It's just not how God works. And I know there are those that would like to believe that or teach that, but that's, that's just not true. And all of us can give testimony, I think, to that. Because those trials are part of God's plan. It's part of God's design. And I'm going to end with one more quote by Spurgeon. He said, last of all, let each child of God rejoice that we have a guardian so near the throne. Every Jew in Shushan must have felt hope when he remembered that the queen was a Jewish. Today, let us be glad that Jesus is exalted. I mean, in a sense, in this story, although it was God behind the scene doing everything, in a sense, Esther walks out of this story as the Savior. She was there for that time. She's the one who risked her own life to speak out and to save her people. And so we don't need to look about for a human figure as a Savior. We have Jesus who sits at the right hand of the Father. And so we don't have to wonder who our champion is. We don't have to wonder about who's fighting for us, who's going to step up and speak to the king on our behalf, because it's Jesus. And how much joy should we have, how glad should we be have that he has been exalted as the Father promised, and it's by his name that we approach the Father with our prayers and our petitions. Cool story, cool story. So next week, as I said, no Wednesday night, but we do have candlelight service on Thursday for Christmas Eve, and then we're not in a position to do what I like to do sometimes, switching the Old and New Testaments on Sundays and Wednesdays, because we just got into Acts on Sunday, so we're obviously going to remain there. I think we're going to push right forward into Job, and uh, it could be a timely study. Job's a great book. Great book.